Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be invited, and uh, I just jumped at the chance to come to Prague for my first time. As we say in English, it was a no-brainer to say yes to this conference, and the discussion has been really inspiring. Um, I run an architecture practice based uh, in New York um, with my partner Eric Bungay, who is here with me. And we've been working on the problem of designing livable cities through the design of innovative housing and public space. So we're architects, we love buildings, but we don't think of buildings as objects. We think of them as part of the public and social infrastructure of the city. And so um, in the following two projects, Carmel Place and Chicago Navy Pier, um, I'm going to talk about how we think about small moves and small strategies and how they can add up to a much larger impact on the urban environment. And, um, and, and, through, that, um, and through that process, um, our office finds opportunities um, at the intersection of architecture and zoning policy and architecture and public space and landscape design to think about and to find ways in which to connect people to their urban communities and to their context in meaningful ways and in more authentic ways. Carmel Place is the winning competition um, of a public competition launched by our former mayor Bloomberg um, and the New York City um, Planning Commission and the New York City Housing and Preservation Department. It's a prototype. It's meant to be a pilot project to test the feasibility of shrinking the minimum size of new apartments down from what was currently 40 square meters net to something around 27 to 37 square meters. So the question that the, um, that the city was asking was how small um, should a livable apartment be? For us, um, we wanted to think about how we could think of, this, think of the small moves, the incremental small moves of this project, how it could add up to bigger spaces um, and bigger, bigger impact. To be honest, when we were first invited, we were not sure whether we wanted to be involved with this project. Um, is this the right thing for our career? Do we really want to be associated with designing something that is potentially inhumane? But when we realized that it was in response to a radically changed urban lifestyle and urban demographics, and to a major housing shortage, we were inspired to act. And so the story of the micro units actually begins with Jacob Rice, who was a Danish immigrant turned activist journalist at the turn of the 19th, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, who focused his cameras on the impoverished conditions of the urban poor, mostly immigrant um, population, exposing the horrific crowding, the lack of sewage, the lack of proper ventilation for more than three million people, at that time more than half of the city. His book, How the Other Half Lives, published in 1890, shocked the civic leadership into action. And so the housing reforms that followed in the subsequent decades encouraged people to live in larger spaces and banned SROs, which stands for single residency occupancy. Um, it's kind of like a lodging house. And also banned more than three unrelated adults from living together. That is a rule that many New Yorkers break. So we need to understand that our current housing regulations were born out of this very noble desire to improve, to greatly improve the tenement condition of the early 1900s. And, in, so, and, and they effectively set the new legal standard for size of apartment, um, size of windows, the new legal standard for light and air, health and safety. The paradox is that that was geared towards very large nuclear families. And since the 1950s, the American home has been ballooning and growing, almost doubling in size. But the paradox is that our family size has shrunk from about 4.4 children per family to now 2.2. And at the same time, the diversity of that family unit has gone from the nuclear family to something much more complicated. The fact is we have changed. We are living longer, we are living more healthy, more green, we study more, 
we are working more, we are marrying later, and divorcing more. The result is that nearly half of Manhattanites live by themselves. And this is a trend that is not only reflected nationwide, but also worldwide, where the rate of living by yourself is up by 30% in the last decade. I couldn't find the statistics for Prague, but I found it for Czech Republic, which is 33%. And typically, the cities are a little bit higher than the national average. So you are somewhere between New York, London, and Vienna, I think. The problem in New York is that we have 1.8 million small households, and that is qualified as one to two person households, one to two person families. 1.8 million small households, but we only have one million suitable apartments. So what do we do? We cram ourselves into illegal sublets, and we subdivide them. And if we are unlucky, we have no proper right to a lease, no windows, no proper ventilation, in spaces that are certainly smaller than 40 square meters, and in fire hazardous situations. Our options seem to be these illegal sublets or commuting very long distances in from the suburbs. Eric and I know because we did our research, we crammed ourselves into a 37 square meter apartment for five years, that's including the closet space. The Adapt NYC competition was launched in 2012 to test a potentially new paradigm for housing in New York, the micro unit. And they asked the question, how small should a livable apartment be? And this is the Progressive City Planning Commission that Carl Weisbrot heads, testing, taping out on the floor what they thought was the minimum livable space. Um, this was prior to launching the, the competition. So, our challenge for the competition was not only how to make something that small feel big and spacious and humane, but also to rethink the concept of apartment living. What should micro-unit living look like? How should it be organized? And so we thought of the building as a dispersed home, where you would find everything that you normally find in a home, just not in your apartment, dispersed throughout the building and shared with others. I feel very humble talking about this here um, in, in respect to all the great social housing that is done in Europe. We look to Europe for the example. But anyway, um, we tried it and we thought about how to connect the shared amenities of the building um, with the urban context. Better connection and better sense of community. To put, them in, to put those spaces in the most public spaces of the building. What if we rethought some of those spaces um, the, the lobby, for example, as a street connecting the urban park on one end with the small tenant park on the other? What if we rethought the gym and the cafe on the ground floor as the porch that opens out onto the sidewalk and really improves the connection of the interior life from within as well as the activity of the street into the building? And what if we not just focus on the smallness of the project, but how micro leads to macro and vice versa. And what if we think about building community at many different scales, at the scale of every single floor, at the scale between the floors, the scale of the building, of the site, and of the community. This is our site. That's us, the little David surrounded by the Goliaths. The site was, um, is uh, in the east side of Manhattan, surrounded by hospitals, public transportation, um, public housing projects, private housing projects, the parks, and in a bowl of brick. It's a very, very New York condition. So what is the macro vision of a micro-unit apartment building when it comes to the massing? We didn't want the building to be expressed in terms of its smallness, in terms of its micro nature. We didn't want the individual units to be expressed. We looked for a very New York image, the skyline. And so the building essentially is four mini towers, kind of a miniaturization of the skyline, clad in four shades of gray brick that 
kind of mediate between the light and the dark brick of buildings that are on either side of it. So in a sense, it is the space in between the existing buildings. And the reason why the macro is important is because the macro, the whole, we thought, should be more than the sum of the parts. Because the whole is part of a much larger story about how architects should be responding to much larger shifts in demographics and lifestyle. The whole, paradoxically, is made up of small things also, small micro units that were prefabricated in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and trucked across the Brooklyn Bridge overnight, several per night. And this is an image of the Navy Yard, and this is an image of the stacking. There's a 55 apartments, but a total of 65 units, 65 modular units, because it includes the um, a stair and elevator core, and it includes all the public amenities spaces. This is the plan of a typical floor plan, where you can see the, um, it, it's made up of nine modules, eight apartments, and the last module is the stair and elevator core before it's pieced together. So out of the 55 apartment units, 20% are affordable. That, I'm sorry, 40% are affordable. That's about 22 units. Out of the 22 units, eight go to homeless veterans, and the others are pegged at different income levels. Now, our apartment building is only 55 units. It's not really going to make a very sizable dent in this, form, uh, this current Mayor um, de Blasio's agenda to um, increase uh, affordable housing by uh, 200,000 units, um, but the hope is that with more micro units that it would ease and greatly improve the supply of small apartments and try and, and hopefully um, improve the, um, the cost of, of those small apartments. That is the hope. So Ivan and Yaromir these are, this one actually is about three, 30 square meters, but the, they range from 27 to 31 to 37 square meters net, so it's perfect for Prague because uh, the average here is 31. Um, if we shrink the size of apartments, if we shrink the floor plate, what should we give back? We think that we should be giving back in terms of how big it feels, and so we have oversized the windows, much larger than what is typical. We have designed that living space to flexibly accommodate many different scenarios because effectively the eating, the lounging, the living, the sleeping has to occur in one space. Um, and we think that we should give back in terms of the height, the ceiling height of the apartments. The minimum height in New York is eight feet, which is um, 2.6 meters, I think. And so it's interesting to think about the volume, the cubic volume of this. The minimum cubic volume before is only 10% larger than what we have now. So as architects, the tools that we are in control of, space, scale, dimension, are very powerful. And only a little bit makes a very big difference. We think that we should give back in terms of the connection back to the site through the very large windows that would connect you with the activity of the street, the activity of the park, and really activate the site much more than the empty parking lot that was sitting there. So what now? The Carmel Place just opened for tenant move-in just a week ago or two, two weeks ago. Um, as I mentioned, the hope is that more micro units would help the cost, um, the, the, the market cost of these. This building is probably an expensive prototype because it was the first of many in terms of design, technical, and code aspects. Um, but our hope is that with the micro moves, that it would make a much larger macro impact on the overall strategy of the city to just add to the diversity and the mix of apartments in the city. 
The next half of my lecture, which I know I have five minutes, um, is about our public space design. So very quickly, I wanted to preface this with our temporary installations, which we called almost buildings, which is an idea about designing buildings that are incomplete, unfinished, to be finished by the users or the misusers. And when I say misusers, I mean the people who misinterpret it, who misinterpret, misuse, um, and uh, appropriate our buildings in, in ways that we didn't anticipate. That has always been very inspiring to us. So we did an installation at PS1 MoMA in, in New York out of green bamboo that turned from green to yellow by the end of the summer. Um, complete with fog nozzles and microclimates to provoke different modes of lounging. Um, seven years later, we used the same construction technique to do a polycentric theater in Taiwan um, to create a space for theater and storytelling where audience and spectator share the same space. And more recently in Milan, we did um, another version of that, but this time out of five millimeter aluminum um, that sponsored all sorts of events, concerts, um, kids looking at their strange reflections. Um, this, the idea of almost building informs our typical building commissions and it definitely informs our public architecture in public space um, projects because in all those projects, we're trying to figure out how to connect people to their context in a meaningful way, how to connect people to the, the real city or the, the things that are going around them or to the changing condition of climate and weather and sky condition. So this is our Chicago Navy Pier project. It just finished. Um, it's in collaboration with James Corner Field Operations, who is the designer of the High Line. The pier was called the Public Pier. Um, part of Burnham's plan um, for five such piers on the lake, only one was built. This was the pier that we inherited. No Chicagoan would be caught dead on this pier. Only tourists go here. It was awful, absolutely tacky, full of things that said, eat me, consume me, listen to me, see me. It was just chaos. The lake is actually to the right of this slide. You couldn't even see the lake. And so, Part of our work was just to start erasing, erasing all the noise, erasing the golden arches. As soon as you do that, half your job is done. And just connect Chicagoans back to what is so great about the city, Lake Michigan. And so our scope was a series of architecture structures from small to big um, that produced a kind of rhythm and a cadence along a one kilometer long pier. And all of the structures in some way are about reflecting Chicago, reframing the city and re-engaging with landscape. The first is the info tower, which is kind of like a miniaturization, a mini, a mini tower of um, the Chicago skyline. It's clad in a glass that has a chrome interlayer that reflects the changing sky it reflects the historic buildings and its context. And at night, it takes on a completely different presence. And the light, um, the, the light lighting designer um, uh, designed it such that it would reflect the, um, the, the cycle of the moon. The second um, series of structures were much smaller kiosks clad in a corrugated um, wood and metal cladding. One side is wood, the other side is metal. So when you approach the pier and you enter the pier, the presence of these structures is very different from when you exit. And that for us is the role of architecture in public space, to make you notice and to rethink your context. This, the third um, series of structures is called lake pavilions. We simply wanted to just take a slice of Lake Michigan and float it above the dock. So it's clad, uh, the soffit is this reflective uh, metal uh, soffit that really picks up on all the activity of the dock, on the changing sky, on the changing water. In the summer, it's like a Caribbean blue, and in the winter, it freezes and is completely white. And so again, it's about architecture reflecting the impermanence of our urban condition and absorbing all the activity um, that is on the dock of people, water, and collapsing all those views into one. And lastly, the wave wall, 
which was an existing plinth that we extended. Very simply, we wanted to connect to the upper level and also connect to the dock. And so we pulled it out to connect to the water, pushed it in to connect to the upper level. And so it creates this kind of lookout. It creates shade. It creates connection from the dock to the upper level. And more importantly, it's a social destination. And what is funny is that we argued and argued with the client about this because they didn't want the step at all. They just wanted 500 feet of retail. And we argued that social spaces that are flexible and that are open to people using them however they want is good for business, is good for the entire experience, and is absolutely necessary for people to be able to feel that they can appropriate public space and make it their own as well as share it with the rest of the city. Thank you.